thank you. Thank you uh, for having me in this amazing auditorium. Uh, I have, have this, I've, I've been here for about 24 hours and it's been terrific. Uh, I want to thank the University of Poznan first and foremost for inviting me, uh, the art education department especially. Uh, I had a terrific opportunity to meet with some of the students today for a workshop and it went great and I'm excited about the workshop that I will be presenting tomorrow to more students uh, and thank you for coming to this particular presentation. I also really want to thank Sonia Rahmer over here for uh, doing everything so this can happen as well as Pia. Uh, thank you also very much for coordinating my stay. Uh, I, I, I like Poznan very much. <laughs> Good 24 hours. Um, so with that being said, uh, my name is Brian Kavanaugh. Uh, I am uh, from the United States. I'm going to get into that in a bit more in a moment. But I will be talking today with everybody here about uh, facilitating artists who absorb the world differently than me. Uh, I've worked uh, nearly 15 years working with uh, artists with disabilities, from primarily autism spectrum disorder to a variety of other disabilities. and as an artist myself, which I'll get into later, uh, it has always been one of my primary motivations doing the work that I do to understand how people who understand and absorb the world differently than me in very uh, crucial ways might um, respond to it through a, a creative art practice. So this has been a, a privilege of mine to do for 15 years, and now I get to travel around and talk about it. So I'm going to do that now. Um, a little uh, introduction to the kind of place that I've worked at and helped build, uh, known as a supported studio. Uh, a supported studio is, as you can see up here, uh, but it is a sustained creative environment supporting the uh, individual practices of visual artists with disabilities. That is to say that we focus on creating a studio practice for these artists. Uh, the educational model of these spaces uh, is not one where somebody signs up for a certain amount of years and then graduates, but rather usually somebody comes into a program and is part of it for potentially the remainder of their life. It could be a matter of decades or, or however long it may be. Um, but a function of it is also to build a community. So that is an integral part as well. Um, so we facilitate uh, creative practices of adults with disabilities and artists with disabilities, as well as make an effort to make sure that their artwork is in the community through um, uh, more normative art exhibition means, so in, in galleries and so on. So to be professional artists in short. That being said, a little bit about me. Um, I am from what can be called the Rust Belt of uh, the United States. That's in that nice pink circle up there. There's five Great Lakes. There was a time where there was a lot of industry and a lot of iron was shipped on them. So it's called the Rust Belt. That is the number one geography lesson of the day. Um, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, which is nearly the westmost point of uh, New York State. Uh, oh, and I should mention, one reason I'm gonna go into uh, my biography very shortly is because it's always important for me to tell people how I got into this field that I'm in. It's a question that comes up a lot. And it, uh, it's always fun for me to talk to people, uh, university students, uh, who because I didn't know at your age that this was a possibility until I kind of accidentally fell into it. So I like spreading the news to artists and art educators that this thing exists and this is how I got into it. So as I said, uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, we are known for a few things. We have some terrific architecture, some horrible winters, and we invented chicken wings. So, you're welcome. Um, so I, I was in Buffalo, New York, and then I was very fortunate to uh, live in a state with a very good education system. There are 50 states, so there are 50 education systems. Um, I was fortunate to be in a good one. And I went to uh, college at the other end of the state, at uh, Purchase College, State University of New York, outside of New York City. Uh, it's kind of the art school of the, uh, of the state system. It was great. I loved it. I went originally for photography, and then uh, 
uh, graduated with interdisciplinary studies. There's a sculpture. And while I was in college, and would go back home to Buffalo, New York, uh, which was about a six hour drive, so for any long break, uh, I would work, because I had to work, I would work in uh, assisted living homes or group homes. Uh, anybody knows what that is? Adults with disabilities who cannot live independently and need assistance. Uh, there are a variety of programs that uh, provide such living spaces. Uh, and the benefit for me was they are open 24 seven so I can get overnight shifts anytime I wanted, or I'd get any shifts I wanted. Uh, and as a young artist, I got free meals. So it was a win-win. Uh, and I also just enjoyed the work, really. I, I got to spend time with uh, some terrific people and got to know people who uh, were in almost every way imaginable different than me, and we just hung out for a while. So it was cool. Uh, so, after I graduated, I moved back to Buffalo, New York, and uh, I was very fortunate that soon after moving back, an organization that I had worked with before, named Autism Services, uh, had received funding to open up a supported studio uh, in addition to the programming that they already had. Uh, so I was very fortunate for that, and the fact that they wanted to hire artists, not art therapists. Uh, a distinction that I usually make in regards to that, because often people ask me if I do art therapy or if I am an art therapist. Um, I say no, one reason being I have no background in it, so I can't really state that I am. Uh, in addition to that, uh, while it's a bit of a generalization, the experiences that I've had with art therapists, which have been great, uh, have shown me that in general, their approach is that they encounter somebody and that person, you have a person, something happened to that person and then they're trying to either make peace with that transition or perhaps return to who they were. So that it's, it's more of a, a curative uh, approach, perhaps. Uh, you can think of somebody with a brain injury, who they chant, they, something has happened and they need to make peace with that. Or uh, PTSD for soldiers coming back from war. Uh, it is a transition, uh, sometimes a brutal one, that uh, someone has to live with and art therapy is a terrific thing to employ for that purpose. Uh, my background, working with artists with autism or disabilities, is that there's a person and then we just try to help that person grow and how they can communicate with the world around them. I don't try to, there's no cure or fixing or anything of that kind. So, uh, also, it's cheaper to pay artists. So, think about art therapy. Um, so the name of the uh, supported studio at Autism Services was Arts Work. It is still going. Uh, and in a short summary, uh, Autism Services was founded in 1982. And in 2002, uh, at the behest of the executive director, Veronica Federiconi, uh, they received funding for our program. And uh, they serve uh, artists, uh, uh, rather they serve people with, of all ages, uh, with uh, all degrees of autism. Uh, I don't know if, I'll give a brief summary of what autism is and uh, parts of it for those that don't know. Uh, autism spectrum disorder affects people in a variety of ways, one being uh, social skills uh, can be compromised, understanding how best to make a connection with somebody uh, and uh, read somebody, read facial expressions and so on, or understand what a given moment uh, might mean between two people, <clears throat> um, as well as communicating can be very difficult, kind of exporting ideas can be quite tough, um, as well as uh, sensory issues. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, the ability to uh, prioritize incoming information is quite something. For instance, we're all sitting here and uh, I like to think you're all able to focus on, on the my voice, what I'm saying, and connecting it with the images that you see on the screen and ignoring other sounds or lights uh, or other sensory stimulus that might be coming at you. Uh, to be able to prioritize all that information and then choose what it is you give your attention to is just not a given. Uh, there are people uh, certainly on the autism spectrum where all of that information is of equal value 
and it might not be up to them to prioritize what it is they focus on. So that is another part of being on the autism spectrum. Uh, I should also say it's a spectrum disorder, which means that there's a vast array of people who are on the spectrum, but they themselves may be very different from somebody else on the spectrum. Uh, on the quote-unquote lower functioning end of the spectrum, you may have somebody that has difficulty uh, bathing independently or taking care of themselves. And at the very other end of the spectrum, you might have a neurosurgeon or rocket scientist. But they share being on the autism spectrum. Uh, so hopefully that helps you. Um, and I should also say uh, autism services, the supported studio arts work was a part of a larger program, uh, which for, the, for this presentation, it just helps to understand that if people did not like being in the, in the studio at first, they could leave quite easily. So I'll come back to that, but that's just a function of that particular environment that helped to serve us. Now, I'll talk certainly more about that in a moment, um, but <clears throat> just to get back to me, um, I was at Autism Services for about five years. It was terrific. And I'm excited to share some of the artists with you. Um, but I want to uh, expand a little bit on my background before we get into that. Uh, I decided for a few reasons it was time to get back to school and focus on my own studio practice. Uh, so I went to a terrific uh, graduate school, Cranbrook Academy of Art outside of Detroit, Michigan. I went for my uh, painting degree. It was great. Uh, there's people talking. Um, I uh, chose Cranbrook because it was a very studio based program, which was helpful for me because the last five years I was in a studio with artists working and I really wanted to continue to investigate what that relationship can be, uh, not just theoretically, but practically. Um, and while at Cranbrook, uh, anytime I had a visitor, a curator, artist, and so on, uh, we would talk about my work and some other things certainly, but I would always bring it back to the artists that I had worked with uh, in Buffalo. So I already, I already knew that I loved this work. This just made it that much more apparent to me that I always wanted to have input on it. So uh, after graduating, I was a bit nervous because it's such a very small and niche field. I didn't quite know how I could continue in it, but I knew I loved it. Uh, I'm in the right place, right time again. Uh, there is a, a nonprofit, uh, the Friendship Circle, right outside of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, at the time, they had been serving kids with disabilities uh, for 20 years, and they didn't want to say goodbye to those kids, so they knew they had to create programming for adults with disabilities to continue that relationship. <laughs> After doing some research, they decided to uh, open up a supported studio and a restaurant that would provide uh, employment opportunities for adults with disabilities. Uh, as it so happened, they, in doing research for this project, they called local uh, arts organizations uh, to see if anybody knew anything about it. Uh, they called Cranbrook. Uh, a good friend of mine happened to be the one who picked up the phone call, and she told them about me. So there we go. Right place, right time, twice. That's generally how I describe the fact that I, I'm still in this. Uh, and with uh, Friendship Circle, we created the Dresner Foundation Soul Studio, which is a supported studio um, serving uh, adults with disabilities. Uh, it is somewhat different from the. Uh, it uh, is somewhat different from Autism Services in that it, whereas I said arts work at Autism Services was a small part of a larger program, allowing people to kind of come in and out at their leisure. <laughs> Uh, at Soul Studio, uh, there was a, a studio, a gallery as well, and the restaurant. Um, and so people, the way that that functioned more, because there wasn't more to it, was people would sign up for a five hour day, any day, any combination of days between Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That is only to mean that because of the particular restrictions of this program, we ended up serving people who had, uh, quote unquote, they were, higher functioning than those that I worked with at uh, Autism Services. Each, each supported studio is a uh, consequence of the community that it's in. 
and uh, the resources it has. And so it was a great space. And I should also say, because uh, I always find it interesting and I have the microphone, so um, uh, Friendship Circle, when it was originally founded, uh, it just so happened to be at the exact same time that there was not a lot of support for kids with autism and Friendship Circle was looking for people to support. So it just so happened that my background working at Autism Services served me very well because Friendship Circle, not entirely, but a large percentage was made up of families with uh, children with autism. Uh, so it's just, it was to me always an interesting thing to see how these uh, organizations form based on the needs of their community and what they can provide. So uh, as it worked out for me, it served, uh, I was able to serve them as best I could because it was my uh, expertise. Now, while I was at uh, uh, Soul Studio, uh, I had to communicate uh, goals and expectations and ways of uh, achieving those goals to a large group of volunteers and uh, staff members who had never been in this field. And after having that conversation a lot, I crafted a pedagogy called Studio Matrix System. Boom. And uh, this uh, allowed me to lay out some specific uh, uh, practices, principles, and philosophy for how to uh, uh, facilitate artists with disabilities so that they could feel success in ways that are unique to them. Um, as you can see here, another way of putting it is the purpose of the Studio Matrix system is to identify interests, indulge inspiration, and facilitate progress for ways that are unique to their, their wants, needs, and preferences. Um, one reason that I crafted this was um, it was a little bit stunting and aggravating at times when people measured success of an artist with a disability by whether or not they could uh, um, perform something technically well. Because to others they would think, okay, they have gone beyond their disability, so this is good for them. Rather than look at it as a, uh, through, as I did, as the eyes of an artist, where I want to see a way of making that was unique to the ways that somebody might experience the world. So I, need, I needed to communicate that sort of philosophy to people who uh, may see it differently, but in clear ways. Um, so there's a metric within the studio matrix system that looks at uh, somebody's preferred subject matter, their motor skill abilities, and how uh, long they're able and willing to give attention to something. And there's no qualitative measure of the subject matter or uh, motor skill ability, we just want to know where to start, and then we want to make sure that we lean into that motivation so that they continue uh, doing something that they want and devote more time to articulating it. Uh, a little tagline that I have for the Studio Matrix system is one million decisions. We want to put somebody on a path that they're willing to make one million decisions, because at the end of that, that'll be a language that they have uniquely for how they communicate with the world around them. And if we have more of those out there, then that just leads to a better archive of what it is to be human at this time, uh, or any for that matter. So, I made that, and I had a terrific uh, day today speaking to some of the art education students about it, and I'm looking forward to doing it, doing it again tomorrow um, in more detail. But continuing on. Um, then I applied for a Fulbright grant. A research grant to come to Romania, where I'm now located, uh, living in Bucharest, um, because I wanted to find out how I could create a language uh, with the Studio Matrix system uh, to introduce it into communities that have no precedent for practi these practices at all. Uh, and, and Romania serves that purpose very well uh, because they are, they, there is no uh, precedent for certainly supported studios or giving very much value to the expression of adults with disabilities. So while it's challenging at times, uh, it gives me the opportunity to understand how best to communicate value in these practices to people and then how to do that. Uh, so I'm three months in, I got six months more to go, and it's going great. Uh, and I am collaborating with the University of Art in Bucharest and as luck would have it, right time, right place, third time, about a five minute walk, there is an organization called Autism Romania, which is uh, the only, at least in Bucharest, 
the only organization focused on the needs of adults with autism. So there's that. So that's me. But now I want to talk about some other people. <clears throat> uh, some of my, the fa my most favorite thing uh, of doing these sorts of presentations, uh, as you might imagine, is speaking about the terrific artists that I've been able to work with. Uh, so I'm going to lead you through uh, the creative arc uh, and the progress of five terrific artists that I've been able to work with. Uh, and also, it just so happens, uh, well, I did this on purpose, but uh, all five artists happen to be on the autism spectrum. Uh, tomorrow in the workshop, I'll be talking about another artist with a uh, more physical disability, but I uh, figured it was a good opportunity to kind of lean into a particular subject. Uh, so this guy, Richard Nesbitt. Uh, I know him as Ricky. Uh, Ricky's a great guy, pretty funny. Um, and I don't usually, I, I work with him in Buffalo. And I'm, uh, I don't usually introduce somebody by telling you their limitations, but for the sake of this conversation, uh, I will let you know that uh, Ricky happens to be on the quote unquote lower functioning end of the autism spectrum, which is to say he needs a lot of support in his day-to-day -day life. Uh, he also happens to be mute, uh, so cannot talk, uh, deaf, uh, cannot hear, uh, and has uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so. It is difficult for Ricky to communicate and uh, experience uh, uh, strong social connections uh, because of autism, certainly, and then you uh, combine that with the fact that it's very hard uh, for him in a variety of other ways. It is difficult. So be it. Um, Ricky, at first, he did not want to come into the uh, studio at all. I think he, he just saw uh, a room full of objects and colors and so on that he didn't know how to connect with. He didn't know what was expected of him. He certainly didn't know me very well. Uh, so usually he would just kind of duck in and then leave. And again, this was a benefit of having the studio set up as it was. He could leave, uh, which is always an important option to have, um, especially for someone like Ricky. Uh, after a little bit, he would come in uh, and I think he, he would see what other people were doing which just gave him the opportunity to understand what could happen in this environment. Uh, and then he started to have a little bit more trust with me and I was able to communicate particular things to him uh, in pretty simple ways, but effective ways. Uh, and at first, uh, we tried, he was willing to try some drawing. And this allowed us the opportunity to see what uh, materials he preferred in a very simple way. Um, this was one of his very first drawings, uh, and he had like oil pastels. You guys know what those are? Uh, oil pastels, I think he liked it one because of the very smooth application uh, and the fact that uh, a pencil might break and then you gotta sharpen it. Uh, a, a marker will slowly run out of ink and then it's done. Whereas with uh, oil pastels, the color is just consistent throughout until it's just no more, until it's not there. So in terms of how Ricky, what he wanted to experience or what he enjoyed, oil pastels it was. Easy enough, but an important starting point. Um, and so usually what he would do was, as you can see here, uh, he'd have a small piece of paper, he'd fill it, fill it in, and then to him he was done. For his uh, particular approach, it helped for him to have a clear beginning and a clear ending, and then that was that. Easy enough. Uh, what this also allowed for was, over time, uh, it was very easy to extend his practice uh, by just giving him bigger paper, uh, which uh, after our relationship uh, grew and he trusted me more and I could give him suggestions and however I could, he was up for it. So usually he would, uh, on these larger papers, he would create a shape and then color it in uh, and make some pretty terrific ones. And a very nice uh, natural consequence of this, the larger they were, was uh, he was put in the position to have to choose his own personal palette of colors. He would, he would draw with an oil pastel, it would end, he would have to choose another one. Uh, and this is a common uh, practice uh, in the studio matrix system and supported studios of making sure that a particular activity will have a, uh, a uh, propulsive or a um, 
a natural consequence that will lead to more decisions. Because there, there was no way, me working with Ricky, that I could teach him color theory or the benefit of particular color combinations. He had to create an archive in his own mind of those experiences to pull from. Uh, and the natural consequence of using these materials was it was up to him to do it. Uh, so over time, he got larger and larger pieces of paper and crafted a more uh, complex composition, certainly, <laughs> and uh, utilized more colors. And he really began to uh, create a personal style. It was clear that uh, the forms that he was drawn towards and the colors as well. And like many artists we worked with, uh, I wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to uh, take part in what it was to be, what it is to be an artist. Uh, if anything, this would give us the opportunity for Ricky to experience other experiences. So that again, he could put that, he would have an archive in his own memory and uh, bank of experiences. Uh, one such thing was uh, archiving his own work and documenting his own artwork. Uh, so uh, he, we had a camera that was hooked up to, uh, that was on a tripod, and then with the cord hooked up to a TV set so he could see what he was facing. Uh, this was good because Ricky would not put his eye up to the camera and it, was pretty, it would be pretty impossible for me to explain to Ricky what, you know, to look into a camera. He would just, he would think I'm only looking really close at a plastic box. Like to, it's kind of an abstract idea to explain to somebody like, I'm pointing this at this thing and it is, do, it is digitally recording it and then we'll have it for later. It would just look like I'm really up close to something. So, uh, so we made, uh, hooked up the TV and he could understand the relationship. Now, over time he created, uh, uh, if this is getting too loud, you can just throw something at me then again. Um, over time, uh, he started creating even larger drones. Our largest tables were approximately a meter by three meters. Uh, and we had paper uh, for the purpose of covering those tables so they wouldn't get too messy. Uh, so that was our largest paper. So that's what he was drawing on. And at this point, he, Ricky, who would not come into the studio at all a few years before this, was now independently choosing to come in for three to four hours at a time. And he made some beautiful drawings. Yeah, it was really, it was incredible to see lots of these drawings being made and him creating a uh, technique and process of his own. In fact, uh, particularly in the, in the lower drawing of these, you may see uh, lots of areas where there's clearly like single lines. That's usually when he would come, get to the end of a particular oil pastel and kind of like rubbing out the very last little bits of it. So we ended up just sort of creating his own language with these tools in the process. Uh, and knowing what would come of it and then utilizing those as well, which was just always a terrific thing to see. So we ended up having a lot of these, uh, some measuring over 100 feet. Uh, they were incredible. We were spending a lot of money on oil pastels, but it was great. But, uh, it was a, yeah, it was great. At times we would buy uh, larger collections of oil pastel so that there's more colors, but he would usually revert to the colors that he preferred that much more. Uh, so, I just always remember that. So at this point, uh, about four years into working together, as I said, Ricky had progressed a tremendous amount in making some incredible artwork, which was terrific. Uh, and things are going good. Uh, and it just so happens that another important part of who Ricky is is, uh, and how he connects with the world around him, is he has these uh, plastic animals. You'll see them right here next to the oil pastels. He, he, almost every day he'd have a different combination. Uh, and he, he came around in his pockets, uh, and anytime he'd sit down, he'd, he'd, he'd have them up on the table kind of facing him, as if they were, as if they were, he still wanted to feel a connection with others. Uh, so he made sure that he did. He had a little herd of his own. Uh, I can only imagine how uncomfortable it is to walk around with three rhinoceroses and a seagull in your pants every day, but uh, he did it. 
and they're with them comfortable. Um, but anyway, it was uh, very clear that this is an important part of who Ricky is, and uh, we wanted to see if we could uh, fold that into his artistic practice in a way that he would be excited about. Uh, we tried some things, uh, such as I, I remember taking a photograph of a collection of his animals when he just laid them on the chair and printed it out and he drew on it, but he didn't seem to be really into it. Uh, there's a lot of other things that we tried during Ricky's practice and many and everybody else's that they weren't into, but uh, it was just as important to find out what was working. Uh, so then I remembered that we had used um, the camera before on the t with the TV, and uh, Ricky was pretty comfortable with that. <coughs> so I wanted to see if he'd be into photographing his animals, uh, and this is actually the, the very first time that we tried it, and. Uh, Ricky took to it quite quickly. He, I think he could really understand. At this point, he, was, he knew what the camera was and the TV set and how they related to each other. And he composed these four ox in the, uh, in the, in the frame quite well. Uh, and then I remember very quickly making sure to print out that photograph and give it to him so that he could understand how they were all connected. Sounds great. And then what we started doing was uh, would take a chair and put it on the table and his very large drawings uh, would just sort of drape on the chair, onto the table, and on like that. So there's a vertical, a vertical part of it, and then also ground, and then we would point the camera at that so that it would, be, it would fill the entire uh, uh, space of the photograph. And Ricky ended up making some incredible images. And he, uh, at this point, we had a large collection of these drawings. So he was able to choose what particular drawing he wanted for those particular animals that he might have. So it was really relating the layers of his creative process to each other uh, in a way that was unique to him. Uh, and he, uh, it was great. That's one of my favorites. Looks like the cow was just awkward. Like, why am I with these buffalo? So it was quite clear, again, that uh, Ricky, who with all of his challenges, uh, found it very difficult, understandably, uh, to make connections with others, with other people. Um, but it's not as though that idea or that instinct or that wish to do that wasn't within him. Uh, he, as you can see in these photographs, uh, uh, they, they describe relationships between others who would otherwise not relate. Uh, but it's not, he never haphazardly composed these. He was always making a relationship and uh, uh, a story of sorts uh, that I thought was quite beautiful and really opened up uh, a bit of who he is uh, and helped us understand him. Um, so at this point, uh, Ricky uh, has many photographs. Uh, and as I said, we always want to treat artists as professional as we can. There was a, uh, it still is, a contemporary photography gallery in Buffalo, New York, called SEPA Gallery, C-E-P-A, um, that every year they have a members show, and we usually put in the work of some of our artists uh, to be part of the community. Uh, and they ask if anybody wants to be uh, considered for the grand prize, which was a solo show, uh, it can just uh, provide a 10, uh, 10 piece uh, portfolio. And we thought it was a terrific opportunity to just choose Ricky's 10 best photographs as well as make sure that he was uh, represented as a professional artist, because he's definitely putting in the time, uh, as uh, one does. Um, so I still remember that night. Uh, I went in, I don't remember who it was, but somebody very quickly got in my face and yelled that Ricky had won. Ricky had won the grand prize of the solo show based on the merit of his work, which was great, which was, yeah, that was, that was a terrific night. Um, so, cut to, I'm gonna, Hop skip around for a moment to get this video going. Let's see. I think I got it. I think I got it. Yeah. So cut to Ricky and his solo show uh, at SEPA Gallery. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, as much as possible, Ricky could uh, understand what was happening uh, and as involved as possible in the uh, in the process, so in this image, 
Uh, you can see I built shelves that came off the wall so that we were able to drape his drums just as we did in the studio. And then Ricky came in prior to the opening to uh, place some animals on here just as he did in the studio. So that gave him the opportunity to come in to understand what was happening, to see it was all his work. And because of who Ricky is and the challenges he has, uh, actually it's kind of a funny story, uh, I had made a model of the gallery and try to show him that little model, as artists do sometimes, make a model of where they're showing to plan out the exhibition. And he gave me a really weird look because to him, I was just showing him a very weird box with little pictures of his artwork. So like, you know, to him, that, it's such an abstract idea. Uh, as it is, it's a pretty abstract idea in itself just to put a thing on a wall in an empty room for people to look at. Uh, so when I showed him a weird box with his, with little things of his, he, he was just like, okay, man. Uh, so being what, who Ricky is and not being able to describe something abstractly to him, I had to walk him through the whole process and then that allowed me to say, did you like that? Do you want to do that? Uh, so I wanted to make sure that he was as included as possible in this installation uh, and he enjoyed it. Um, he was there. Usually Ricky would come to a art opening. There's a video that was projected. Uh, actually, this is a, while, while I can't speak, this, is a, this happens to be something we put on the wall. This is Ricky's uh, typings. You can kind of see his obsessive compulsive disorder come through here. Uh, he would usually repeat words. His mom's name is Elaine. So this little, this little ditty right here is horse Elaine, Elaine, hat, 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 horse, rock, rabbit, horse, Elaine, Nesbitt. By Ricky Nesbitt. Um, so, um, as I said, he would usually would not want to stay in uh, opening for very long at all. This one he stayed for the entire three hours, shaking people's hands, making eye contact. Uh, and being uh, very proud. Uh, it was clear that he was very proud. He understood what was happening. He understood that people were there for him. Uh, and it was a terrific moment. Um, suffice it to say, uh, his mother, oh, can I get back to it? Am I doing it? I did it. Uh, suffice it to say, his mother, who uh, had Ricky, his father had passed since we had the show, but uh, his mother, who was told uh, when she had Ricky, uh, with all of his challenges, she was told point blank pretty much that Ricky's just not going to be able to provide much to the community at all. So it was understandably a very emotional night for her and Ricky's sister, and uh, it, it <coughs> is a great, uh, this is one of the terrific stories where uh, Ricky, in this case, is now a contributing member in the cultural production of the community in Buffalo. So uh, it's the art coming out of Buffalo, Ricky is part of that, uh, in Western New York. And uh, perhaps more importantly, what I love is artists in Buffalo are being influenced by his work and vice versa. So that's in the whole creative mix of what it is when you get a whole lot of people together, uh, he's adding into that. So that's Ricky. Uh, that is the longest of the stories. So I'm going to tell you a few more stories about some terrific people. This guy loves toilets. That's my intro for John Overton Burns. Uh, one of the coolest students I know. Um, uh, John, uh, I worked with John at uh, Autism Services in Buffalo, New York as well. Uh, and one thing I always remember uh, about John uh, and I always uh, tell people when I talk to them about the studio matrix system, you know, uh, is I remember when he came to the program, his mother told us that he really likes to flush toilets. And she was like, if you could help him stop doing that, that would be great. Because I mean, in, in, you know, at malls, anywhere he would go, he would want to know how that one sounded and how it flushed. So understandably, she was frustrated. I get that. Uh, but to me, I was just like, I got an in. We're flushing toilets. Shoot! 
So we did that a lot. Uh, and we made some terrific videos. Uh, I'll show you one later in a, very shortly. Uh, and I should also say that Jonathan uh, always dressed pretty sharp. He'd come in with suits sometimes and some and whatnot. Uh, in large part, I believe, because he loved game shows so much. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, like the Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy, or I'm sure you got your own game shows. Uh, he really liked them. Uh, let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, where he would, he would often uh, draw uh, sets. This is from the Wheel of Fortune, and where people uh, spell out things. He had thousands of these drawings, he made many, many paintings. Uh, pretty amazing. Garlic bread comes up a lot. Uh, I think uh, uh, a reason that uh, Jonathan liked these shows, as well as lots of other artists and people that I worked with, was there was like a predictable script to reading people's emotions when watching a 30 minute show. You know, like the, each portion of the game show has to take part in a certain amount of time before commercial comes. And somebody's gonna win, or somebody's gonna lose. You could read that, you understand that, and usually if somebody wins a lot of money, it's pretty uh, untethered emotion. Like you'll see people get very excited, so it's just very obvious. Which is it's not coded, it's not held back. The emotions are very obvious, uh, which is just helpful, uh, particularly to someone on the autism spectrum. Uh, lots of times uh, he would uh, imitate it as well, which was fun to see. This is him. Uh, uh, doing a drawing of uh, Vanna White, who is, uh, uh, I don't know how, she's one of the presenters, one of the two primary uh, hosts of uh, Wheel of Fortune. And she is very happy there, obviously. So, uh, and usually we, we didn't always uh, focus on artwork that could be easily displayed. It was really just, as I said, indulging someone's inspiration and then finding out what could come out on the other end. Uh, so for this particular one, we just made a big Wheel of Fortune wheel uh, and projected one of his small drawings, very large in the background, and uh, as much as we could, kind of use it as a set for an impromptu game of Wheel of Fortune. Uh, and it was incredible to see someone as uh, um, uh, capable as Jonathan, uh, who was very capable, but usually more than anything that came out when he was doing things he was into doing, understandably. Uh, so he very quickly got the idea of what we were doing. I remember he made these large slices of color for the sake of the wheel. And it was just something, it was quite something to see him get, understand what was happening and then like, run with an idea. Uh, which if it wasn't an idea that he wasn't into, then that wasn't going to happen. And as an artist, I can vouch for that being a reality. Uh, another thing he did, he made a lot of small toilets. Like, speak at great length about all of his toilets and urinals. But uh, he, he would make these incredible toilets. Uh, he's still making some in Buffalo, the large ceramic ones now. They're quite beautiful, actually. Uh, and he, uh, this man just loves his toilets. He'll inspect any toilet. Now, another thing we did uh, was make videos over the course of all the years that, yep. uh, make uh, videos over the course of the uh, few years that we worked together. Uh, and I took photographs with John and so on. And one of the last days that we worked together, uh, I wanted to, uh, with John, make a video collage and show him uh, a simple enough uh, movie making program and see if he would be into it. And I also explained to him how he could add subtitles and do voiceover. Uh, so he, as I said, it was an idea that he was into, so he got it pretty well. So this is a video collage that Jonathan made. Uh, all of the subtitles are where he wanted them to be, and his voiceover goes with it. And just so I don't come in later, there's a particular part towards the end where there's a yellow background, and he's listing things, and those happen to be stops on the subway in Buffalo. I just want to tell you that now so I don't have to worry. Because if it's in a gallery, sixty thousand dollars bathroom. Take it or leave it. Basking mats. Pontiac. <laughs>
just one delay double to the system. Let's go to work. Before it goes to motion, a dollar for a teller was $500 is in the panel, easy in the $100 tops in this round. At these category Bison, Left Flag Square, Movie, Summer Best, Ellen Hospital, and finally, Pharmacy Island. This is a Good luck to you. Stars. I always love that it ended it with a good luck to you. Uh, right, yeah, that was a, a video of Jonathan's, a video collage. Uh, and this uh, last shot of Jonathan is him uh, installing at a gallery, actually, a, a curated called Art Space Buffalo. Uh, some of his many uh, Polaroids that he took, mostly of uh, toilets and urinals and sinks, uh, as well as uh, locks on drawers and everything. He was really drawn towards sort of simple mechanics of things, kind of like a toilet, but he would always kind of, just things he was very interested in. He was, he was prodigious, really. Well, that's Jonathan, a cool dude. All right. We got Dan. Dan Carey. Hope I'm doing okay on time. Uh, you guys still into it? Yeah? Uh, Dan Carey. Uh, another gentleman who I had the opportunity to work with uh, at Autism Services. And one of the funniest people I know. Uh, and just a great, great dude. Uh, each of these artists I could easily spend two to nine hours speaking about, but I'm going to do it in five minutes. Uh, that's him, but he usually, Dan usually carried around a CD or something where he could see his reflection in. Uh, it was something that he would, uh, uh, the, the technical term is perseverate, or kind of obsess over it, or something that uh, allowed him to kind of uh, interact with the world in a way more comfortable. Uh, he wouldn't always look directly at somebody, but he'd more gladly look at their reflection. Uh, or he'd like to look at his own reflection while actually rocking back and forth, just sort of having that sensation. Uh, and he is coloring a self-portrait of him right there. This is uh, one of uh, uh, um, Dan's very early uh, drawings and writings. And the top up there is something emblematic of his work, where he'll, uh, he's listing these particular actors who were in TV shows. Uh, and TV shows that were actually big when uh, Dan was a kid. Uh, I believe he watched a lot of TV. He would usually... Uh, Mentioned them a lot. Said Alan Alda will be on One Day at a Time. No, he will be on Mash. Or Ed Asner will be on Archie Bunker's Place. He will be on Luke Grant. Uh, for Dan, who was a very humorous guy, one thing that he found a lot of humor in was going against what would otherwise be thought as obvious. So he'd like say somebody who wasn't on a show was going to be on that show because in his kind of autism mind, he was like that. That's hilarious to him. Saying something that's obvious. Saying something that's obviously wrong, but putting it out there is very funny. Uh, so I just always thought that was great. And to kind of also, sometimes he would write about some violent things that were funny, uh, in a good way. Uh, he would say, like, uh, you'll see in a moment, but uh, uh, local newscasters like to fight each other or something like that. It was hilarious. And something that I was able to do, I found a uh, little video clip with some of these shows, actually. Uh, this was, oh, let me just introduce this. This is like a, when it talks about shows that'll be coming up. It's like on Tuesday, watch these shows. And hopefully you can understand, but uh, there's a moment where you'll just see like the emotional arc just kind of shift because they're trying to cram three storylines into 15 seconds. So I'm just imagining a young Dan watching that and just finding it so funny that it would be like very funny and then very sad and Tuesday. Yep. Tuesday, it's war on man. You knock off the horn, we shower. And it's a fight to the finish. Then a race driver's in Anne's line. Ah, he is a fast company on fast track. There is one woman in this world who isn't chasing his chauvinistic chat. On Lou Grant. Charlie. A personal crisis. There's something I've got to tell you. Charlie's daughter's aboard a plane in trouble. 
the landing gear. It worked fine in Seattle. Why isn't it working now? Lou Grant, following MASH in One Day at a Time, Tuesday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain. So, for instance, they were talking about one of the particular shows where something funny was happening, and then it very quickly went into another show where somebody was very sad because their daughter's on a plane that might crash. So, in terms of thinking about Dan, who's a young kid with autism, maybe watching TV, trying to figure out how humans interact and communicate, and that's the emotional roller coaster. Uh, I think it's pretty good that he found humor in that. Um, yep. uh, again, I, I would love to talk about uh, all these artists at great length, uh, but I picked some terrific parts to uh, put together. This is uh, Dan uh, and part of his process uh, and uh, a painting that became a performance, really. Uh, it started off by him listing bad things, which he usually loved to do, but he used to love listing them. So no stealing, no kicking, no punching, no hitting. And then he got into a pretty long list, uh, and he loved doing that, just saying what not to do. Let's see, no putting scissors near people's eyes in McDonald's, check. Uh, no putting your hands through the fence at the zoo. These are really educational paintings. If you guys don't know these things, this is helpful. Uh, stop eating staplers, don't punch at the hospital, don't bite dogs. If you guys don't know that, now you know. So that's good geography and social functioning. Uh, and so he did that and then he started to go over it with this terrific little, uh, little large abstract pattern. Come on, knock on my door. Come on, knock on my door. We'll be waiting for you. We'll be waiting for you. Crazy as a hands and hands and feet. Please come to me too. Come on, knock on my door. Come on, knock on my door. Take a step that is new. Take a step that is new. Take a step that is new. Space can be too crazy. We can be too. You'll see the method of going. I'm going to come up for you. Kids are people too. <laughs> Kids are people too is another TV show. So I just want to point out, especially. Uh, you know, as a, as a bunch of artists here. Uh, Dana Sigmataro, come on down. Uh, Dana is a terrific artist who I worked with at uh, Soul Studio outside of Detroit. Uh, again, they, it just so happens that these group of five artists uh, all happen to be on the autism spectrum. Uh, always a bit important to mention that. Uh, Dana is a, also a very prodigious artist uh, and very skilled to a large degree as well. Uh, this is a drawing of a car she did. Uh, when we first started working together, this, these sorts of drawings that she did just informed us of her technical ability, uh, which was, uh, allowed us to know how to support her as well, uh, as well as how long she was able and willing to give attention to something. She wanted to see something all the way through, and she drew a car, she enjoyed it, and she had some technical skill as well, which was very cool. This is a video of uh, Something we did at Soul Studio was have a, uh, we call them uh, discussion groups, similar to like crits or critiques, maybe you guys have been there, because where you show your work and get feedback. Uh, if anything, this gave each artist the opportunity to understand the importance of uh, others seeing your work and taking ownership of that experience too. So usually I'd ask each artist as much as I could to have either place each artwork, how they might like it, a drawing on top of another, whatever it may be. Uh, and then they would somewhat offer feedback and would also enable some people to title their work. Uh, Dana happens to also have uh, aphasia, which just means words. Uh, words can get expressed differently, like she might call a coat rack a bus or something like that. Uh, it's hard for her to she needs to think very hard for her to use the word she wants to use. Just so happens, she'll say a lot. Uh, well, <laughs> she'll say the word a lot, a lot. She'll also say big time. Like I'm like, hey Dana, how you doing? She's like, big time. I'm like, all right, all right. 
You feeling good? A lot. Uh, so these activities gave uh, myself and her the opportunity to kind of reinforce uh, what she was thinking when she was making work. Um, and this is a short clip of that. Of course, they're not on the ground. And why are they on the ground? There's blood. There's blood? Yeah. Oh. Why is there blood? Don't know. You don't know? Yeah. I miss her. Okay. Yeah, I what about this one up here, Dana? She has a bum go to his room after the party. Big time? A lot. The, the, the kid, say it one more time. A lot. The kid went to his bedroom because why? He could go to his bedroom right after the party. A lot. After the party. Is the kid wearing a shirt? No. Big kid went to the party's bedroom. Big time? Why isn't the kid wearing a shirt? Because he threw the clothes in the fire. Big time? He threw the clothes in the fire? He threw the clothes in the fire? Okay. Hey, like... What's that? You want to show me? What are you talking about? I think he's playing to the middle one. That's your favorite? Yeah. Why is that? Why is that your favorite? You like just how it's done? Yeah. Okay, cool. I like that one too. That one's yeah. really pretty cool. I, it looks like a road coming towards you. Yeah. Okay, so what is this a picture of? Dana, this one right here. What is that a picture of? A window. A window. You mean right here? Windows on a building? Window here in that morning sky. It's a morning sky? Yeah. And what are these colors? Robots. Hmm? A lot. Um, so you could also see it was an opportunity for others to give their input, which was just a great way to uh, um, support the communal feeling of the space. She also said that Dana has said a lot that her paintings and she makes ceramic objects and um, all sorts of things. She says they're uh, images from her dreams. So at times there's uh, some pretty fascinating works, uh, including things like bears doing karate, or her wrestling dinosaurs. It's pretty great. Uh, this is one of, actually I own this painting now, I bought it. Uh, I love it. Uh, I think it really, really shows just her innate, uh, terrific ability at composing uh, a, a image and creating space that kind of lets us know what's happening there without giving it all away. Uh, this is a, a person losing her good suit. Somehow this woman's going down the water slide and her bathing suit came off and it's beating her down the water slide. Uh, I think it is, like, these things can't be taught, but from the information given, where the woman's legs are and how they are pointed would lead one to believe that the rest of her body is in the same position as her bathing suit here. They seem to be in the same sort of uh, uh, direction, same sort of silhouette, uh, and the function of the water slide itself just kind of leads your eye down, so it lets us know what's about to happen in a sense without giving much away, and that sort of uh, visual play and visual understanding of what information is of value uh, and what does need, what can be in there, what doesn't need to be in there, is just something that I'm always amazed by and Dana exemplifies uh, to an incredible degree. So I love this painting and I like talking about it. This is uh, one of her ceramic pieces. It's a woman sunbathing. I think Dana sunbathing. Uh, and I think she, uh, I think her mom probably has a problem, but it seems as though Dana sunbathes naked a lot. She usually brings up this kind of stuff. Dana has a terrific uh, fashion sense, uh, or no, none at all. So uh, I show this because uh, another thing that we did uh, to kind of fold Dana's artwork into itself so that we could have more outcomes was she would create uh, terrific ceramic pieces and then we'd print them out and then she would paint around them the best. So she would kind of continue the composition of the subject matter uh, to uh, create some even more informative and terrific uh, uh, artworks. And the final product was always pretty great because even though the, it was sort of uh, uncanny how this, these clay objects would exist in this painted environment, uh, they would, I just always loved them. And uh, she was up for it and uh, she made some terrific ones. Uh, the largest one being five feet tall by six feet 
wide for a show that we had and had specially printed. It was a bear doing karate. And then she, I don't have it up here, but the bear is standing in front of like a cinder block about to karate chop it. That's the uh, uh, sculpture. And then when she painted it, it was the, the inside of a dojo. That makes sense. I just wanted to uh, focus a little bit on Dana's terrific eyewear. She's got some great fashion. And this is her making a sculpture of a place that you're not supposed to be at. Um, and this is uh, a gallery in Detroit, Michigan, uh, where I don't have footage of her doing it, but uh, we had a show with three artists from Soul Studio, and Dana came in and uh, installed her own work, as well as gave it titles, which uh, each of her paintings that you see on paper uh, is uh, with tack stuck to a piece of wood, and she wrote the title underneath it. So, that's some great ones. And actually, in the top left corner is uh, a bear doing karate uh, in a frame, and uh, the dojo was painted. Last but not least, Stephanie Harris, this terrific flamingo loving woman right here. Uh, who I worked with at Soul Studio and uh, for the entirety of my time there because she was part of the pilot program. Me and Anthony both wear white shoes all the time. And that's her rules. It works rules, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Work rules. Right? Work rules. Uh, it's common for a lot of people uh, on the spectrum, certainly lots that I worked with, to uh, appreciate and respect and at times need rules. Because that way they understand the world a little bit more. Like, you should do this, you shouldn't. Or like, you saw Dan with his bad things. Like, in case you're thinking about putting your hand in, inside of a fence at the zoo, there's clear rules saying not to do it. So that's helpful. In a world where there's a lot of gray area, uh, lots of people I know on the spectrum actually enjoy and ask for what are the rules of this space. Uh, some people I know, a young man I worked with, Sam, he, when he went to work at the restaurant, it was very important to him to put on his uniform because that just meant like this shirt is on now that means i'm doing this it's a, it's a concrete way of understanding the world so stephanie herself very much enjoyed rules it helped her understand things but it, it, it wasn't it didn't uh, restrict her but it gave her definition that being said uh this is some of stephanie's drawings uh, and these are very large and also in large paper about this tall uh, and a rule that she and I came up with early on was to cover up all the white on the paper. Uh, simple enough, but it made sure that she was uh, accountable for all of the space in any particular uh, drawing or painting. Uh, whereas she, at first, would just want to uh, create the subject matter, which in this case is, you know, that's a building in the top uh, or the bottom left, and it's usually uh, landscapes. She would do the part that she cared about, and then just leave the rest pretty, either half done or not done at all. And, uh, and it was just very clear that portions of it she uh, was into and then other portions portion she just half-assed. So a rule that we created together, and she liked it, was uh, to cover all the white. That let her know that something was done and that her uh, um, effort was consistent throughout the making of it. This is uh, Stephanie signing all of her artwork uh, in our pilot program. She also is very prodigious. I think in, in large part, she was very, uh, I love Stephanie, Stephanie is great, and she loved uh, having an identity of her own as an artist. So anytime she would come to the studio, she would just make constantly. Uh, and it was great, it was great. Um, one uh, terrific moment that I always liked uh, thinking about was how Stephanie, uh, after working a bit on some things, figured out how to help her own process. And um, she uh, would usually create, a, she likes, she loves Walt Disney World, and would usually do paintings or drawings with all the characters as much as she could. And uh, I would tell her like, these are great, but I don't, I don't know which character is which because it's all becoming one thing. Uh, and then she would insist, she's like, no, that's all of Walt Disney. I was like. That's great, and that gave us the opportunity for me to have the conversation with her about what it is to make sure that somebody who's looking at your artwork, they're seeing what you want them to see. And I just told her that if you want me to see individual characters, I, I can't on this. And she thought about it. 
And uh, she went ahead and did this, which I always thought was just pretty brilliant. And I didn't know what she was doing. She didn't tell me at first. She, uh, you can see in the, the left pictures, she would, on um, cheap paper, just in her way, draw uh, one of the characters uh, and then glue that piece of paper up to the, uh, on this case, we were just working with drop cloths because they were big and cheap. She would do that. And then uh, whatever parts of that person were peeking out, she would paint that part of it. So she very, uh, I was pretty ingenious. She kind of made placeholders for each character and then understood what would still be uh, visible. And then she would go and paint those parts. So I thought it was a really terrific and brilliant uh, way of solving uh, that problem. Uh, and I was just really proud of her for figuring that out in a way that uh, was her own. I didn't teach her that. I just uh, approached her with the fact that if she wanted people to have a certain experience, she needs to take a particular part of it into account. Uh, and she solved that. So I cut to a few years on, it was always important for me with the artists and that everybody in Soul Studio for them to grow and any opportunity we could for them to get involved in a new way was always terrific. This uh, large painting uh, was terrific, a hotel in Israel uh, that she made with the assistance of another artist, uh, Clara up there. Uh, and Clara happened to have a background in uh, painting, certainly, but knew a lot about uh, blocking off of parts of the canvas for the sake of other parts. And this was something that uh, Stephanie took to very much. And then I asked Stephanie if she wanted to make a frame for this painting, and others as well. And she said yes. I asked because it was just another layer of Stephanie that we could add to it. And so we went to the wood shop, and she took to sanding wood and, and drilling it together. And then even though it's not on the image on the right, she had this very big uh, bright pink uh, frame. So. Uh, there's somebody with a very big, somebody bought it, a very big painting of the hotel in Israel with a very bright pink frame. So if you run into it, which would be amazing, you know who made it. Uh, and then lastly, again, we wanted to make sure that people had as much opportunity as they could to understand what it was to be an artist, not only in the studio, but in the community. Uh, and at the same show that Dana exhibited at, Stephanie showed some work uh, and she is uh, deciding on the sequencing of some of her prints uh, and uh, at Simone D'Souza Gallery in Detroit and she's helped out by uh, Virginia Torrance, an uh, uh, artist and uh, gall uh, gallery worker. Uh, yeah. Stephanie, it was a terrific experience at this particular show. Um, it was very cool. Uh, Stephanie, being who she is, and she, as I said, she's very excited at having the identity of an artist uh, and having something to talk to people about. Whenever people came into the opening, Stephanie was there, Stephanie would just go right up to a person and say, hi, I'm Stephanie, can I show you my artwork? It was just great, and her mother, uh, Michelle was terrific, but always a little bit hyper aware of how Stephanie can kind of bring attention to herself and sometimes not the best of way. Uh, her mother just sort of instinctively kind of apologized to Simone, uh, the gallerist. She was like, oh, sorry that she's doing that. Uh, and Simone was just like, no, we wish every artist would do this. Like, we wish every artist would just be like, hi, how you doing? I'm this person. Let's go look at my artwork. Uh, so it was just a terrific, uh, I always remember that moment because it was just, it, it, Michelle, Stephanie's mom also was just kind of elated herself. She was like, ah, all right, great. <laughs> and Stephanie was just glowing. So that was great. That's my presentation. Uh, thanks for uh, listening, sticking around. Okay. You can clap. That's okay. You can clap. <laughs>